Welcome to our uh, celebration of International Women's Day, Food is the Right Forum. Um, we have a number of speakers for you today. So um, first, just so everyone knows, my name is Joe White, anybody who doesn't know me. Um, and I um, direct the dietetic internship and chair the food science department at Dominican University. Um, along, chairing along with me today is um, Linda McDonald. Um, she is from, also from a United Methodist Church and a food pantry um, in, that, um, in that area. So she's going to help co-chair uh, with me today. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Her name is Chris Hamill. She is from the Moratorium Now Coalition to Stop Foreclosures, Evictions, and Utility Shutoffs. And she's going to talk about International Women's Day and the economic struggles um, that working people are facing today. Thank you. Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. OK. I'd like to, uh, first of all, say thanks to uh, Jill and to all of you for allowing me the, uh, the honor to speak to you this afternoon. We're here to discuss the struggle for food and basic necessities of life, as well as to commemorate International Women's Day, or International Working Women's Day, which is March 8th. March has also been designated Women's History Month. This day to honor women around the world and a history month came about because of the fierce struggles of women of many nationalities, both here in the United States and internationally. There is some debate over what inspired International Women's Day, but many believe it was because on March 8, 1908, some 15,000 women garment workers courageously walked out on strike in New York City. Most of these women were immigrant workers from Ireland, Italy, and Eastern Europe. They faced terrible conditions and low wages and sweatshops that were death traps for many. Word of this struggle reached women activists in Europe. And remember, this was well before the internet and uh, cell phones and all, all the things that we enjoy today. Two years later, at the Second International Socialist Women's Conference in Copenhagen in 1910, it was the German socialist Clara Zetkin who proposed that every year, March 8th, be designated as International Women's Day a day to honor working class and revolutionary women around the world. The resolution passed unanimously, and in 1911, hundreds of demonstrations were held throughout Europe on March 8th. The first of two revolutions in Russia started on International Women's Day in 1917, when women organized demonstrations demanding food and calling out over 50,000 workers on strike from factories in Petrograd. Tired of shortages in bread and basic staples of life, the women and men rose up, the feudal czar was overthrown, and growing revolutionary fervor led to the victory later that November of the Russian, Re Russian Revolution, whose demands were peace, land, and bread. The struggle for food, you see, can be a revolutionary force in the class struggle, which is the struggle between the haves and the have-nots, between the 1% and the 99%, between the capitalists and the rest of us. Since those early days, International Women's Day has been commemorated by socialists and progressive women and men around the world, from South Africa to Cuba, Australia to the Philippines, and right here in the US. It is a day to commemorate and honor the struggles of working class women of every nationality in the fight for a better world, both past and present. This, this year, it's especially fitting to honor the women who have stood up to racism and racist police killings to say black lives matter. We pay tribute to the young African American women who have led this growing movement for justice, who have been on the front lines, as well as the mothers who have held their children or been kept from holding them as they died, victims of racist police brutality and murder. 
After such horrific and ongoing killings and police brutality, what a breath of fresh air it, is, it has been in this country, a country founded on chattel slavery and vile racism that continues to this day, to see a movement emerge where young black leadership has united people of different backgrounds and nationalities to demand enough is enough, stop the killings, black and brown lives matter. Now I'd like to focus for a bit on the city of Detroit where I'm from to give a flavor of what has happened to our city, of what is to blame for the situation we're in and how we're fighting back against the many injustices and indignities perpetrated on our communities by racist predatory banks and their politicians. It's important to know about this because the plan the bankers, bosses, and politicians forced on the city of Detroit is a blueprint for what they want to do across the country, including here in Chicago. The Detroit judge who oversaw the city's recent bankruptcy case which was the largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of the US, the other day suggested in so many words that he wanted to use the Detroit bankruptcy as a roadmap for destroying public workers' pensions, which are deferred wages already earned by workers in cities across the country. It seems that bankruptcy judge Stephen Rhodes had a hidden agenda all along when he invalidated the Michigan State Constitution provision which protected public employees' pensions. These cuts, amounting in some cases to an aggregate 50% of a retiree's pension and health care insurance, are devastating to those retired workers and their families who were promised their pensions, part of their wages earned by working when they retired. But huge amounts of that money has been taken from the pensioners to pay debt service to the banks. What an outrage and crime against the workers. Retirees and their supporters, despite the caving in of the unions to the, the official union leadership to the pension cuts, marched many times in bitter cold weather outside the courtroom and are still fighting today. Women retirees have become outspoken leaders in the struggle for justice for city workers. If it had not been for this struggle, the cuts would have been much, much deeper. These banks that robbed the pensions, and we passed several of them on our march today, they're the same ones that have been proven to have deliberately constructed and used a racist plan targeting women of color, especially seniors and single mothers, for adjustable rate mortgages, which quickly ballooned out of control, causing tens of thousands of foreclosures in Detroit and millions more around the country, including here in Chicago. The mass home foreclosures, evictions, and subsequent vandalism and gutting of these homes have destroyed huge areas of once great neighborhoods in Detroit, as well as the small business base along the city's main thoroughfares, which look more like streets in war-torn Iraq or Afghanistan instead of Motown, a once thriving and great city, especially for black workers who came from the South looking for union jobs at decent wages and a good life for their families. Those days, for the most part, are long gone. The auto plants have shut all but two factories in the city of Detroit. General Motors and Chrysler were bailed out in federal bank bankruptcy court by our tax dollars. Then the banks moved in to take what was left from the city of Detroit. From a population of over 1.8 million in 1950, and once the fourth largest city in the United States, Detroit has seen the exodus of almost a quarter million residents in only a decade. Now with under 700,000 residents, Detroit is at its lowest population in over 100 years since 1910. For those who remain in our majority African American city, Unemployment and poverty caused by the corporation and banks have been severe. The jobless rate for youth is at 
40% of the population lives below the poverty line. According to the Kids Count annual study, a staggering 59% of children in Detroit live in poverty, the highest rate of any of the country's 50 largest cities. Woefully underfunded, apartheid-like public education in decrepit buildings with a system still under emergency management is what Detroit children face when they go to school. A struggle led by women has fought valiantly for many years for equal quality education for Detroit students. But they are up against the forces of privatization and a right-wing governor who will stop at nothing to keep the status quo intact. At the same time, the gentrification of downtown and midtown is taking place at a rapid pace with Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers and the chair of Quicken Loans, one of the mortgage companies that contributed to Detroit's massive foreclosures, rapidly buying up huge parcels of land as well as buildings and skyscrapers throughout downtown and midtown. The city's bankruptcy last year and takeover by an emergency manager appointed by the right-wing governor meant that hundreds of millions of dollars were taken from the city's budget to pay debt service to the banks. City retirees were robbed of their hard-earned pensions and health care benefits. And water shutoffs happened to some 30,000 homes. Now, 62,000 homes are facing tax foreclosures this year, starting at the end of this month. At every juncture, the workers and community have fought back. We've won concessions here and there and halted at times the full-on onslaught to some degree. But it hasn't been enough to stop the predatory beast of finance capital, which wants to take everything from the workers and poor and give it to the banks and the rich. This is the backdrop to the water crisis, which developed last year in the city of Detroit with mass shutoffs to 30,000 households making news around the country and around the world, largely due to the struggle that erupted in response to this entirely preventable human catastrophe. People from across the United States, as well as Canada and other countries, came to Detroit to show solidarity and deliver water to the people cut off and to express their outrage at this massive violation of the right to a basic necessity of life. Freedom Friday protests initiated by the Moratorium Now Coalition were held every week last summer. They would start at the downtown headquarters of the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, where activists, retirees, and community members would picket. Then we would march to a bank, usually marching right through the middle of Dan Gilbert's Campus Martius Park, where his private goons operate like rogue cops. We'd march right into the headquarters of Bank of America or onto the steps of Chase Bank as security either gave us the silent nod or attempted to throw us out. The Detroit cops stood back because they supported our efforts to stop the pension cuts. This situation of tens of thousands of families without water shut off because they owed a mere $150 on their water bills caught the attention of concerned people throughout the country. The National Nurses United Union at the Net Zero in conference in Detroit last summer joined with local organizations and helped to bring out thousands in a mass march through downtown on July 18th. Just days before that, on July 15th, Moratorium Now was selected as one of 100 independent objectors to the bankruptcy austerity plan to speak at a public hearing in front of the bankruptcy judge. We laid out to Judge Rhodes what a travesty it was that national and international attention was on Detroit because of massive criminal water shutoffs and that he said when it comes to the bankruptcy in the city, the buck stops with him. So he had better do something about it before the people rise up like they have so many times in Detroit's long and militant history of struggle against injustice. We said he needed to order a moratorium on the cutoffs 
and restore water to the people and order the water department to take back the $537 million in bonds that it took from infrastructure repair funds to give directly to the criminal banks for termination fees. We were the last speaker before lunch. A chord was struck with the audience as they erupted in applause at this testimony. Right then and there, the judge ordered the city's water department heads to come to the courtroom at 2 o'clock and tell him what was going on and what they planned to do to stop the shutoffs. By the time the 6 o'clock news came on, why you would have thought that Judge Rhodes thought of the water issue all on his own, out of the goodness of his heart, and not because of the bold struggle of moratorium now and all the people and retirees in the streets. Like most everything, poor and working people and oppressed people have won in this society. It was because of struggle that the water shutoffs were brought into the city's bankruptcy trial and into the national limelight. Day in and day out, brigades went into the neighborhoods to stop the shutoffs, to chase off the trucks of the private contractor that was hired to do this dirty deed. Water was delivered and water stations were set up for individuals and families. Eventually, activists from the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization and the People's Water Board, as well as a Canadian human rights group, petitioned the United Nations to intervene in Detroit based on the water shutoffs being a violation of international human rights. Two special rapporteurs from Geneva were sent by the UN to Detroit to investigate this situation. Here is part of the joint report by the Special Rapporteur on adequate housing as a component of the right to an adequate standard of living and the right to non-discrimination in this context, and Special Rapporteur on the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation. Visit to the City of Detroit, United States of America, October 18th through 20th, 2014. The report was dated October 20th, and I'll read some of it to you now. Without water, people cannot live a life with dignity. They have no water for drinking, cooking, bathing, flushing toilets, and keeping their clothes and houses clean. Despite the fact that water is essential for survival, the city has no data on how many people have been and are living without tap water, let alone information on age, disabilities, chronic illnesses, race or income level of the affected population. Denial of access to sufficient quantity of water threatens the rights to adequate housing, life, health, adequate food, and integrity of families. It exacerbates inequalities, stigmatizes people, and renders the most vulnerable even more helpless. Lack of access to water and hygiene is also a real threat to public health as certain diseases could spread widely. In addition, thousands of households are living in fear that their water may be shut off at any time without due notice, that they may have to leave their homes and their children may be taken by Child Protective Services as houses without water are deemed uninhabitable for children. In many cases, unpaid water bills are being attached, attached to property taxes, increasing the risk of foreclosure. About 80% of the population of Detroit is African American. According to data from 2013, 40.7% of Detroit's population lives below the poverty level. 99% of the poor are African Americans. 20% of the population is living on 800 US dollars or less per month while the average monthly water bill is currently $71 per month. This is simply unaffordable for thousands of residents, mostly African Americans. We were deeply disturbed to observe the indignity people have faced and continue to live with in one of the wealthiest countries in the world and in a city that was a symbol of America's prosperity. 
We were also distressed to learn from the low-income African-American residents of the impossible choices they're being compelled to make to either pay their rent or their medical bill or to pay their water bill. It was touching to witness mothers' courage to strive to keep their children at home and the support people were providing to each other in order to live in these unbearable circumstances. And it was heartbreaking to hear of the stigmatization associated with the shutoffs, in particular the public humiliation of having a blue mark imprinted on the sidewalk in front of homes when their water was shut off due to unpaid bills. In line with the mandates entrusted to us by the Human Rights Council, we would like to underline that the United States is bound by international human rights law and principles, including the right to life as well as the right to non-discrimination with respect to housing, water, and sanitation, and the highest attainable standard of health. These obligations apply to all levels of government, federal, state, and municipal. Moreover, they also extend to the various functions of state, including the judiciary. The rights to non-discrimination and equality are core principles of international human rights law. Governments are obliged not only to refrain from discrimination in the design and implementation of laws and policies, but must strive to ensure substantive equality for all. The United States has ratified the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which explicitly prohibits and calls for the elimination of racial discrimination in relation to several human rights directly affected by water disconnections, including the right to housing and the right to public health. And the rapporteurs also called for various specific measures that the city and state should implement immediately to alleviate the crisis and formulate a sustainable plan for the benefit of the people. But this remains to be done. Nutritious food is also a universally guaranteed human right according to the UN's International Covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. But like with water, that doesn't make it a reality. It will take a mass movement of the people to win our rights. In Detroit in the early 1980s, the Food is a Right campaign took to the streets and also took the Reagan administration to court for warehousing tons of food while a hunger crisis raged in our city and in others across the country. Mayor Coleman A. Young, the city's first African-American mayor, because of this struggle, declared a hunger state of emergency and weekly commodity food distributions began, which continued for 17 years. Every issue is a woman's issue. The human rights to food, water, housing, education, health care, and every necessity of life, and to live a life free from racism, sexism, and anti-LGBTQ oppression will be wrested from the system by the people's struggles. Like Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a struggle. And we'll win every battle once and for all when this profit first system of capitalism is overturned and replaced one day with socialism, a system run by and for the people where rational planning for human needs come first and not the greed of the bankers, bosses, and billionaires. Water is a right, food is a right, Black lives matter, women's lives matter, all power to the people. Thank you very much. Thank you for that powerful presentation. Um, my name is Linda McDonald. I come to you not as uh, my profession as a dietitian, but to introduce our speaker. Um, I'm part of an awesome group of volunteers that provide food to families. Across the city of Chicago, there are pantries all over. Uh, last year, our pantry provided 12,000 
visitors with food. These are people from a variety of backgrounds, many who are working people, but their wages are low. And so they need the help um, of food pantries and any kind of assistance. And so I want to introduce Donzel Baldwin, who, uh, come right on up, Mr. Baldwin, who's going to talk to you a little bit about those people who are working for that struggle for higher wages. Well, uh, first off, I want to thank everybody for allowing me to come up here and speak. I'm not going to be that long, but I'm just going to be powerful and real, you know. But um, I'm from Rockford, Illinois, and I'm working with uh, Fight for 15. If you none of you never heard, it's uh, fast food workers, you know, trying to get together, uh, fighting and marching and protesting, you know, trying to get $15 and, you know, a right to form a union. And um, I've been doing it for about a year and a half now, maybe. You know, we've been everywhere, Chicago, you know, Indiana, you know, going back and forth, trying to help everybody out, you know. And um, it's a pleasure to be here and see so many, you know, faces and so many young people, you know, out here trying to strike and, you know, marching for the right things, you know, the right reasons. But um, one of the many reasons why I got into this campaign, you know, was um, I, I met a lot of McDonald's workers, you know, working at McDonald's for over the last two years, you know, you see people come and go. And, um, you know, I've seen a couple of people that's been there, you know, for three years plus, you know, 10 years plus. You know, you ask them how much they make, you know, they say, oh, I'm only making, you know, 825, 875, and you think, wow. You know, after about, you know, three, four years, you should be making, you know, at least a living wage, you know, and it's, it's unfair that McDonald's make, you know, billions of dollars each year, and they don't have the audacity to help out the people that help them make money, you know, live their life, you know. And um, my four-year-old daughter asked me one day, you know, I asked her one day, you know, uh, what do you want to do when you get older? You know, she said, I want to work the same place you work at which is McDonald's. And you know, so when I joined the campaign, you know, I'm like, I'm not doing this only for me, but it's for the people that's, that's afraid to step up to the plate, the people that's afraid to go out there and raise their voices for what they believe that is right. And you know, for the people that's, that have no knowledge on what's going on, like my daughter, you know, in years to come, if they want to work at McDonald's or any other fast food restaurant that they get, you know, the proper things that they need, you know, money, training, um, clothing, whatever, because McDonald's, they don't provide us with everything that we need. You know, everybody, you get hurt on the job, they don't follow up on what's going on, you know, and it's just not right. And so it's a lot of, a lot of stuff that's going on in the fast food corporation period, not just McDonald's, that a lot of people is unaware of, and we out here to try and you know, educate people on what's going on behind those doors because a lot of people don't know. And they think just because it's fast food, okay, I'll just, I'm just i coming by for five minutes just to get a burger, a fry, and a drink, <clears throat> you know, that people don't work hard to make that, you know, that five, six dollar meal for you. Like, there's people in there doing two or three jobs and they only getting paid for less than that one job that they're supposed to be doing. And, um, McDonald's is just not fair at all. You know, um, they made $5.6 billion uh, 2013. And you know, it's ridiculous that you making that much money and that was just profit. That wasn't even after taxes and everything, you know, and it's just ridiculous that they doing this to people that work for them, you know? And um, it's just crazy, you know? Um, I got a one year old that got cerebral palsy and um, it's hard getting back and forth to doctor's appointments, you know, uh, just getting gas, you know, just to where you gotta go. You know, we gotta come all the way to Chicago, which is like two and a half hours, and don't always have the, the money to get up to Chicago, you know, and if McDonald's would raise, they, you know, give everybody that $15 raise or, you know, two, $3 raise, that'd help out a lot, you know. Um, after you get to work in so many, you know, you work so many hours, you work so much money, I mean, you get so much money, you got to pay your bills, you know, after you pay your rent, gas, you know, lights, you left with nothing, you know, you, 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 you borrow one from Peter to pay Paul, you know, and it's ridiculous, like she said, that we live in the most, you know, 
the most expensive. We make the most money. The most country, we make the most money. Uh, you know, the United States most money, and people living in poverty. Why? It's people over in Africa or people over in Europe. They gotta walk miles and miles to go get water. You know, and we got it right here with us in this ridiculous. This I can a bottle of water right there. Some people gotta walk 10, 20 miles to go get a, a bottle of water like that, and we making all of this money, and we can't barely can get that water, you know? But <clears throat> I really didn't plan for this, but it's just real, it's, it's what I know, it's what I've been doing, you know? And um, I just hope that everybody else out there can follow up on what's going on and help out support anybody that's out here striking, marching, you know, rallying, whatever, for the right reasons, because it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of people take this to heart, and I know, Tommy, uh, the person I came with, we both been doing it, and we've seen people fall off. You know, they don't want to come out and strike because they going they think they're gonna lose their job. You know, a lot of people don't know they have the right to strike. You can go out, you can leave your job. Like I'm striking today. You can't get fired for that because you have the right to do that. And a lot of people are scared to do that, but we the ones on the main line. You know kind of like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, you know, or some, you know, people back in the revolutionary, you know, era. And we on that front line. When we out there on that front line, it's just like, you know, I put it into like football terminology. You got the quarterback, <laughs> you got the quarterback and you got the line, the front line. That quarterback is behind me. If I'm up here in the front line, nobody can get through that. Nobody can get through me because I'm protecting him. And when we out there on that front line and you look back and you see thousands of people behind you, how are you protecting them? You, you with the front line, it's just me up here. They protecting you. They helping you out. So, you know, even if you're not a fast food worker and you hear about a strike or something, I encourage everybody to hop in that, that thousands that's behind that one person leading them or 10 people or, you know, whatever and help them out because if they raise fast food workers, if they raise the minimum wage for them, they're going to have to raise for everybody else. 40% um, is it 40% of Illinois um, Walmart workers, I believe, or is it, I think it's national Walmart workers is uh, getting a raise this summer to like 1075, I believe, for minimum wage. So if they can do that at Walmart, everywhere else they're going to have to apply. Because if Walmart giving their workers more money, I'm pretty sure they're going to go up on the prices. And if they go up on the prices, people barely can afford what's going on at Walmart right now. So if they raise Walmart prices, uh, minimum wage, they don't have to raise everybody else's. So if you're out there and um, you're not making the living wage, why don't you jump on that board, somebody's board, jump on somebody's train. And we need to win this, win this fight because the communities is getting bad, it's getting worse and worse, like she said. And I think that if you give your community more money, they will help the community evolve a little more better than what's going on right now because it's really not helping us out. If you give me more money, I can give you more money. If you're not giving me no money, I can't spend it. I can't spend money if, you don't, if you're not giving me any money. But <clears throat> Like I said, I wasn't, I'm not gonna be too long, <laughs> but make sure y'all, um, you know, follow up on Fight for 15. Everybody stay in touch. You know, if you don't, huh? <laughs> April, oh, April 15th, we will be out here in Chicago, right? Um, we rallying out here in Chicago. You can get up with me if you wanna know more information about that. Uh, Fight for 15, striking and rallying, April 15th. So you guys get up with me if you wanna know about that. And um, you guys have a good day. Thank you. All right. uh, the next person I'd like to introduce is uh, Magdalena Nava. She's from the Diabetes Empowerment Center in Humble Park. Thank you. You can't get more real than that. <laughs> you really can't. Um, like I was introduced, my name is Magdalena Nava from the Diabetes Apartment Center in Humble Park. 
Um, I'm here mostly to talk about empowerment. Um, it is International Women's Day, and whether, I come from a Latino uh, background, and whether men like to believe it or not or accept it, we are the decision makers at home. <laughs> um, we decide what we eat, we decide what we feed our children, how the bills are paid. Um, the men can bring the money, but we're the ones paying the bills. Um, we're the ones taking our children to the clinics when they're sick. Um, so my role in the community, I feel, is to empower women. Um, I start with education. There's nothing more important in this world than education. If you don't have, if you didn't graduate from high school, get your GED. Once you get your GED, open, doors will open to you no matter what. And as far as what he was talking about, <laughs> um, on a monthly basis, I am fortunate to have a phone and text my sister. Um, and I text her on a monthly basis, I hate grocery shopping. And she asks me why. I said because it's become so expensive. Um, I spend about $150 a month to feed just me and my baby girl. It's just me and my baby girl. And this is all healthy food, that it's considered healthy food. So, and I have a decent job, I get paid, I think, well. Um, but I think about people who don't have jobs, who have to go to food pantries, who have no choice but to go to food pantries. And again, it goes back to the women having to go to those food pantries because you don't see, and again, I'm talking about the Latino community. Um, personal here, you don't see Latino men going to the food pantries without them being embarrassed. I had a participant come into the center last week um, with a bill of a thousand dollars something, a thousand and something dollars from a hospital. And I, she had talked to me about this bill about a year ago. And so I told, I told her, come in, bring me this bill, bring me this bill. And she would tell me, oh, I'll go, I'll go. And this is a year ago. And last week she comes in and she says, you know what, I'm really embarrassed, but um, they've already, you know, the collection agency is already um, calling me and billing me. And so I said, well, why didn't you bring me the bill when you asked me, when I asked you to? And she said, because my husband kept saying, don't take it, it's embarrassing, I can pay this, I can pay this but it never got paid. Um, and so for me, again, it goes back to empowering women. It's very important to empower women. Um, what we do at the, at the um, Diabetes Empowerment Center, we teach about nutrition, which Dominican University has great, great volunteers that come in every Wednesday. They love Anna. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> um, and we also give out, you know, physical activity, Zumba, every type of activity that you can find, and it's all free. Um, and again, because we see the need in the community, when you think about, you know, you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, well, you need to change your diet, you need to lose exercise. First thing that comes to mind is like, oh God, the food is expensive to begin with. You know, it's so much easier to go to McDonald's and buy the dollar meal than it is to go to a grocery store and buy tomatoes, lettuce for 10 bucks. That will, you know, it's so much easier to do that. And again, when you think about physical activity, again, you think about paying the, the monthly fee at a, at a gym. Not necessarily, you could come to the center, you could do, like Anna, they teach great techniques on how to work on your budget, you know, they, I can't talk enough about the Dominican University um, students. Um, and again, today is International Women's Day, so I say more power to us. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have a Kyra Black Blackburn. And she is a student from Malcolm X College. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about everything. <laughs> so um, to begin with, they got us when the word statistics came into place. We were no longer people 
not by the fact that we weren't seen as that for a while in their eyes, a number. They give us these surveys, already sexist and surrogated questions sent to addresses. Bills come more frequently than Christmas cards or simple I miss you um, letters. Demographically, those neighborhoods that didn't partake in the surveys become a negative column number. So therefore, we don't get the resources, supermarkets, or anything of that nature. We just get stumped with liquor stores, food markets with limited food groups, only because of property taxes and because of the back of the truck leftovers. But when food became an industry rather than a culture, sense of unity, family health oriented, and the greed and competition grew with the unbecoming stock market, it was, stepped, it was snatched and manipulated, which caused more farms not practicing cleanliness with their animals, more factories, no more soil to grow grass, animals nectar, no more trees, so we breathe air that probably has more chemicals in it than anything, which causes our ozone layer to thin and, and more meteorites are being crashed into our backyards as we speak. Um, just to go off thought, because everything that we see is an everyday struggle. I know we see it every day. Garbage on the street, we have to wake up and look at that. But after a volcano erupts, the lava hardens and grass always seems to sprout through. But I feel, ladies and gentlemen, if we continue to let this volcano erupt, then, that, then our cycle is at the end of everything. Um, Women's Day. I can't stress enough to even put on that we have to have a right. I mean, we populate the earth. We have countless degrees. We read, we educate. And to actually beg for people to actually give us a chance and a voice is almost sickening. So to go from that, it's just time for us to just actually have a voice, put our foot down, be nasty, be grindy with these people who are the same with us. Because at the same token, Earth has seen everything here. So I think it's time that we just take our place and be who we are truly destined to be, where it's our people, humans. We're not a race. We're not in competition with each other. I believe we were here to be in harmony and be amongst each other as human. I see faces, not color. Eyeballs, not coins. Lips, not paper cuts. Paper clips. So it's just a cycle that we have to end and end it now. Because if we don't, it's going to get pretty hectic. And I mean, I'm ready for the fight. Are you? Let's get it. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers. This has really been great. Um, the next person I'd like to introduce is Esther Scamarella, and she is the director of the Chicago. Uh, Hispanic Health Coalition. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Lucy, for inviting me to make an university. <clears throat> it's very hard to be the last speaker after some good speakers <laughs> were presented before my colleague work in the same area in Humboldt Park. And the young people, because I love all the students here in Malcolm X School. Um, I'm not young anymore. <laughs> but I think it's, I come from Argentina, so I have been a struggle politics for a long, long time. And I think it, what keeping going is having a project to help people. The main issue for the coalition is really to empower consumer. I'm a woman, but I think it's in whatever you define families, everybody in the family is important. Um, <clears throat> so 
when I'm thinking about United States and what is going on today, the struggle that you presented here and the history with good and things and bad things around the world. I don't want, I've been in politics for a long time. Uh, my husband was incarcerated, so I can talk to you about a struggle that continues today. It's not new what is going on. And so what I think it did for me work is to empower the community, to work block, 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 to see that a small change could be big changes. I think in the Koch brothers and all the big people and the big power, it's very difficult with the tactic, how they use the media. And I think I will give one example, when water and sodas and what we drink. Um, under the necessity, we sometimes, when we struggle for economical things, we take $5, $10, because we need to survive. So you divide and conquer. You make people decrease. Even the middle class is a struggle today, not only the poor. The stretching, the, and this is not new in the world, but new for the United States. When there was the abundance, and I will say the stratification that happened today in the United States, when there was immigrant, Italian, Irish, everybody came, and but everybody was had the opportunity. Oh, thank you. Okay. And, and we see today the children of the children of the power, they don't allow where people move. Sometimes we say, oh, I have the chance I come in for the poor family and I can be successful. But this is a small amount. So <clears throat> I don't know all of you, but I think all of you are so important in doing good things and good causes. But how we can work together, not today to be together <clears throat> and talking and everybody going and we don't see each other anymore. Um, and, and we are in a particular situation today in Chicago with the new the elections and the mayors and the, the fighting and people. But when you see that only 30% of people vote, it's very sad. So <clears throat> the power of the vote is important. How we really work block to block. And I think I was talking to some new people that I met today, they working in certain communities. I think yeah, I know the community because I work with them uh, in the healthcare, and not only with the Hispanic, but with the African American, a new project to be sure the people who have hypertension uh, get and, and have service they need. Be family have multiple problems, like a huge problem that you mentioned, your families and what you do. I mean, I'd be mentally ill if I see how many problems the poor people have and nobody cares. So <clears throat> as we are losing the ethical concept in this country. Many countries there are a lot of corruption. We start thinking that here ethics is missing, is one thing. Money talk. Everything is about money. And even it's good the social media that we use to communicate it, isolate us. Family again, how we define, we don't know who live next door. So <clears throat> How we, am, how we start working in communities, how we really say and make a comfortable politician, you know? Because all of you could be more important than what the politician are doing, but we need to make a, and one thing that I really admire in this country is that many people who work on policy issues, and many countries, people have no voice. The power come down, even here, they start to happen from the top down you are still having this meeting and discussing and trying to do something. So <clears throat> with healthcare, it's a big issue. We have in a lot of, and no service, and people don't know where to get healthcare, how much to pay, if they enroll or not enroll, because everything is so complicated, it's a big issue. Related to food, I, I agree with you 100%. I have been, and I confess, working with a big group in Massachusetts against McDonald's. What you say, you know, that they pay less. I think what we don't have in communities, public health and things is 3%. It's job. You go any community, even in the African American community, any community, it's a war zone, and we don't bring jobs and we don't have education because they are like the Wisconsin governor who want to destroy university and they try to say, oh, tenure, we need to eliminate tenure. I mean, 
And people sometimes say with good intention, well, white people have forever job, you know? I mean, then you get talking about sugar, then they say, oh, I'm free. I can drink anything that I wanted. But there has been poison as forever. I mean, and what is the trick? One dollar, you buy a meal. Yeah, you pour, and then you get more sick. So the, the chronicity in the African American and the Latino community is terrible. More obesity, more chronic disease. So of course, all the hospital and community who are poor, uh, helping the poor, will have no money because the new governor will cut every program from daycare to healthcare. To, so, how we prepare to anticipate this power through media and money to strategize working in the base of the community? Here in this country, I've been in different countries, and poor people price education. Here, there's no value to pay teacher. So <clears throat> I don't want to, I wanted to network with all of you to see how we can do and, um, and make it, try to make that, that's my hope, that if we give people in community the opportunity, I think the concept, I work hard with the health promoters, or promoters, empower with education and information. Take time, but people, you know, I remember nobody want to talk about the woman breast cancer. I'm a breast cancer survivor myself. No, I don't want to touch my breast and this and that. Today, there are a lot of health promoters who are doing, working with clinical trials. So education is power. And so take time, but let's don't lose that the power and the magic things, like your example, there are people who really want to make the difference. Sometimes we miss the opportunity to connect with each other. And, and I think I live with that. I think I, I really enjoy working in this group. It's my first time. But let's have a way to, nobody can do everything. But you have ideas, let's create cells and groups in communities and institutions that we can help the people who need us. So thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs>
Um, my kids use this program, or well, I actually use this program too. I'm a single mom. I have two kids. I have a seven-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl. It's really, um, really hard for me in, to find someone to take care of my kids while I'm working. I'm, I know I'm not the only one with this problem, especially moms that they're here by themselves. They don't have anyone else to help them with. Um, they don't have any family members. They, knowing their situation, they can trust other people. Um, my daycare is in the South. It's one of the states, one of the um, places that's really dangerous that we have here in Chicago. Um, even, though the, even though we know that our kids are small, somehow they know that there's something wrong. We keep saying that our kids are our future, but cutting things like food stamps, daycare programs, we're hurting our kids. We're hurting our future. Um, uh, my girl is seven years old. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get a little bit teary. She is 10 years old and she's worrying about kids that don't have enough food to eat in their house. She comes home saying, Mama, can I get, take another lunch? Yeah, can I take an extra apple? Yeah, go ahead. They, it's because we taking our kids, we're not putting our kids on the number one. We need to put our kids first no matter what. Our kids are the future, our kids come first. We need to help our kids, our moms, our families that need help. Um, even though that we don't look back, we're hurting them in the level that's really ridiculous. My girl is about to turn 10 and I'm sorry, it's about to turn 11, and one of her wishes is to donate shoes to girls that their parents don't have enough money to buy them shoes. My girl, or any other girls, any other kids shouldn't be worried about if her classmate has new shoes, or if her classmate has enough food to eat, or if her parents make enough money to support their families. Um, and thank you so much. I uh, wanted to, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Um, I need to relax. I want um, to um, introduce one of my code mates, uh, workmates, Patricia Hernandez. Hi, um, I'm sorry for my speak. Uh, quiero que me ayude mi compañera a hablar español. Mi nombre es Patricia Hernández. Soy proveedor desde hace 10 años. Uh, tengo un daycare en la zona sur, en la zona, una de las zonas más peligrosas uh, de las empacadoras. Es la zona de las empacadoras y más peligrosas de Chicago. Hi, my name is Patricia Hernández. I have been a daycare provider for 10 years, and my daycare is in one of the dangerous places in Chicago, it's in the south side, and it's the Parker's Park. Tengo niños de todo tipo, padres con necesidades de todo tipo, madres abusadas, niños abusados. Para mí es muy importante que el señor gobernador y los legisladores nos escuchen, porque están quitándole la oportunidad a los niños, a los futuros niños. Si estos Recortes existen, va a haber muchos problemas. I have had kids of different um, situations. I have moms that have been abused, moms that they're single moms. Um, and I'm asking to the governor and everyone else to not cut our, um, our funds because if they do, they're hurting not only the families but their kids too. Me es bueno recordar ahora que tengo dos niños abusados y nos, con estos recortes que nos quiten, obviamente los padres van a tener que buscar a las nanis, ¿verdad? Que cuiden a los niños, que no tengan supervisión, que no tengan los cuidados, como dar una buena alimentación, ¿verdad? Una buena educación. 
Tengo dos niños abusados en el take care por nannies. Eso, los recortes, es bien importante que no haya recortes para que nosotros continuemos con nuestro trabajo. I just want to mention that I, in my daycare, I have two kids that they're having really bad abuse with uh, nannies. They don't have any training. They don't know what they're doing. They don't feed them good nutrition food. Um, they don't have any kind of education. So if they cut the cuts, we're hurting the kids and their parents because the parents have to go look for another nanny that doesn't have a clue what she's doing. Agradezco mucho esta oportunidad que nos están dando de expresarnos. Siento a veces que el gobierno se olvida de los pobres, de las personas de bajos recursos, y somos las que más necesitamos. Créanme que ahora yo estoy retrasada con tres meses que no me ha pagado el gobierno. Tres meses. Y yo no he decidido cerrar mi daycare. Porque tengo 22 niños, 25 ahora niños, que dependen de ese cuidado. La zona peligrosa cual les hablé al principio, yo no puedo exponer a 25 niños que los cuide. ¿Quién? ¿Quién sabe? I want to thank this opportunity that you're giving us to express my words and my concerns. Um, I have been without pay for more than three months and I haven't decided to close my daycare. Um, she, we have 24, 25 kids in our daycare and we don't want to expose our kids to the danger where the daycare is, it's a really bad uh, place. There's always shooting, there's always gang activity, there's always something bad and we're not going to take the risk of putting our kids somewhere else. Thank you. Muchas gracias por escuchar. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, I think um, our, our final speaker um, is Brian Pfeiffer, and he's from the Wisconsin Bail Out the People's Movement. Um, Chris from Detroit talked about the conditions that are going on um, in Michigan, which is really, um, as she said, somewhat a plan uh, 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 and, and something that we need to be care carefully watched about um, the positions that the governors are taking in terms of, of workers' rights, in terms of cuts, like we just heard about in Illinois, um, with, the, with the daycare, which is still very tenuous. Um, Reiner here is calling for right to work zones um, in Chicago, which is really a way to um, move the unions out. Um, today there was a historic um, event, and I'm looking at, we're going to let Brian talk a little bit about it, um, that took place in Wisconsin. And it's really um, one of the things I think that should give us all the impetus to try to continue to uh, move into action to defend um, just the basic right to, uh, of all human beings. Brian Pfeiffer from Bill Out, the people of Wisconsin. How y'all doing, sisters and brothers? Hey. All right, ready to fight? I hope so. Uh, this is a great honor to be uh, speaking and being asked to uh, share International Women's Day. The Wisconsin Bailout the People Movement stands in solidarity with women all over the world. And uh, we know that uh, the South African women have a saying, if I can remember it, that if you strike a boulder, uh, you have struck a rock. What is it, Chris? Help me out. Now you have touched the women, you have struck a rock. You have dislodged a boulder, you will be crushed. That's right, that's right. All right, so we're in solidarity with the South African women who smashed apartheid and are still struggling, and women all over the world right here in Chicago and the sisters that spoke today. Uh, this morning at about 9.30 a.m., uh, 80 years of uh, a situation in Wisconsin was gone in 14 days. 9.30 this morning, the Wisconsin State Assembly passed the right to work for less bill and this was after last week's uh, Senate rammed it through in a fast track last Wednesday. And Scott Walker, uh, the governor of Wisconsin, uh, said he will, he's probably signing it now, he said he'll have a, a ceremony on Monday to sign uh, right to work for less 
in the state of Wisconsin known historically as a labor state for decades uh, on Monday. So that'll be in effect uh, Monday. But the thing about that is that over the past two weeks, the people in Wisconsin didn't take this line down. Just like in 2011, when the Act 10 uh, public sector bill was passed, which is a vicious assault on workers. And for those of you that don't know about labor, uh, Act 10 in 2011 was targeted towards public sector workers. And that bill essentially uh, eliminated payroll dues deduction. We call them wage cuts, increased pension and health care payments 10%, made it harder to get into the pension system. And if you were in a bargaining unit, which means that if you're a worker in a given location, like a university or something, that uh, that bargaining unit would have to every year vote 51% of the bargaining unit to certify as a union, and then you could only bargain up to wages, wages up to an inflation. That was Act 10. Right to work is targeted towards private sector workers, whereby workers in a bargaining unit, let's say at a manufacturing company, they do not have to pay uh, union dues to get the benefits of the union. So the union has to uh, work on the contract, get dues, pay for a union hall, pay for people like myself who's a field rep, but people in the bargaining unit now, in right to work states, if this is voted in uh, and signed by a governor, there's 24 states now, Wisconsin will be the 25th, that you can be in a company like that and you do not have to pay union dues. So you can see how this uh, is a vicious assault and attack uh, on labor and unions, especially in cities like Milwaukee and Chicago, which you know, black workers and Latino workers and women workers and lesbian, gay, bi, and trans workers, which by the way, union contracts were the, were the first contracts that existed in this country in the 1970s that passed uh, anti-discrimination clauses and had those in contracts and women. So this is a direct attack. Speaking uh, in, on International Women's Day, the public sector attack was a vicious attack on women because the majority of women uh, workers that have any decent living wage jobs left or pensions are in the public sector in many different capacities. The same thing in the private sector uh, in, to a great degree. So in Wisconsin, in the last two weeks, the battle has been raging. The Wisconsin AFL-CIO had demonstrations and protests. There was a Defeat Right to Work coalition that protested. There was youth and students that had demonstrations all over the state. And the people of Wisconsin did not take this line down. We're going to continue to fight. We got messages today that there's already a, a numerous protests, including uh, one next Wednesday, March 11th. It'll be at the governor's mansion. You're all welcome to come down up to Madison. It's about a couple hours from here at 3 o'clock. We're going to let the governor, Walker, know that uh, we know he's just a servant and a bought and paid for stooge of Wall Street. And we're not going to take these attacks lying down. Just like Sister Chris mentioned that a lot of horrendous attacks and austerity assaults have been happening in Michigan. But the most important thing that's been happening is the resistance has continued on all fronts. And that's what we need to do. In Wisconsin, over the past two months, if you look at the bills that are trying to be rammed through the legislature, they're trying to roll back things in Wisconsin that go back 100 years, go back 80 years. We're talking basic democratic rights, attacking the environment, attacking students, com talking about completely eliminating the University of Wisconsin system, all those types of things. Now, the Wall Street and their paid stooges and servants like Walker and those in the right wing legislature, like one of them today, the head of the assembly said, this right to work bill is about liberty. But the only liberty they're talking about in worker freedom is about austerity and attacking us. And fundamentally, these are racist attacks and anti-women attacks. And so we need to keep fighting. We need to keep struggling, just like the friends in Detroit and all over this country are doing. And ultimately, unite all of these struggles together. One of the things in Wisconsin that was happening, there's a lot of things happening at all different times. But one of the lessons out of this particular struggle was that if everybody was attacked, that was being, that's being attacked in Wisconsin by these bills would have said enough. Students, youth, the Black Lives Matter movement, Fight for 15, if labor would have put out the call to those movements and invited them to come down to Madison and shut down the Capitol and shut down Madison and the state of Wisconsin if necessary and said, hell no, we're finished, we're done, we're not taking it anymore. And that's the next step because history shows that you know, we can fight in the legislature, we can fight to vote, and we fight for the, to the death, to the, to the right to vote for all people. But ultimately, our history shows in Chicago and Detroit and the Midwest, the reasons why we have unions and labor and these laws in place in the first place is because we fought, we bled, and we died in the streets. And that's why these unions are in existence in the first place. And we have to go back to the 1930s and use our lessons about taking the bosses on in the streets and not being afraid to take on the cops and not being afraid to unite these struggles, all the struggles. And labor needs to reach out to the black community, the Fight for 15 community, and that's what we're doing in Wisconsin. There's a lot of great folks on the ground who are doing this and making these connections. 
But ultimately, all of these things that are happening to us, all everything that was happening today, like Kamar Chris said, was that this is all related to a system called capitalism. And everything that we're hearing today, everything that's going on across this country in Greece, you know, in Puerto Rico, in Mexico, in, in Chile, all the attacks on students across this, all the austerity, all the banks that are attacking us, it all stems from the system of capitalism and imperialism. And the only way out of all of this is to eventually fight on all of our struggles on a daily basis to get some relief, but ultimately all working together to smash this system and build a world and bring a better world into birth where we don't have to worry about our children starving, where we don't have to worry about inadequate schools, where everybody has the right to food and everybody has the right to dignity and respect. So we're in solidarity with y'all sisters and brothers we're not going to go anywhere in wisconsin we're still fighting and we're going to take walker down we're going to take these right-wing nuts in the legislature down and we're going to keep fighting and we're going to build a better world thank you all right so now at this time i'm going to open the floor for any comments or questions that anybody would like to ask any of the speakers or remarks that anybody else would like to make Well, I was just thinking when, I'm gonna talk even internationally. I'm from Mexico, my name is Ana. So I remember when I was a child, uh, with five of us, my, pa my father left, and I don't know where is him until now. So my mom was uh, working very hard, and uh, so every time we buy, buy bread, Mexican bread, uh, she has only money to come. We were five of us, so she only gonna buy five pieces of bread, so. Every time we say amen, we want to, the very first thing we want to do is to reach a piece of bread. And um, in, we grew up and we always feel that um, when I think about my past and, and I feel like I was blessed that we always have beans and bread and basic food. And the most important thing as somebody mentioned is education. So for my mom, education was not an option. So we, um, she raised us and educated us and um, when I came to this country, um, I remember the first time I opened a, pan, a food pantry. It was full of different boxes with different colors and all of them called cereals. And I was like, wow, I never saw so many boxes of cereals. And I was like, wow. And then I started you know, looking around the food pantry and it was everything, there was food there that I never saw that in my life. And I was just thinking that, um, how blessed is this country? How blessed families in this country have food? But as I live here more and more and more years, I've discovered there is also poverty in this country. That someone was saying, uh, how, how come in, in the world is hungry and there we have poor communities? And you never think that United States will have that, the same story and the same experience. And now the more I am being dietitian and work in the communities, I feel like more than half of the country, or I don't know if I'm exaggerating, but it's also suffer, suffering from hungry and doesn't have the experience of having many different boxes of cereal, so many different colors in the food, and the fruit, um, um, how do you call it, frutero, you know, full bowl, you know, and it's so sad. And we have the opportunity to get an educator here. We have the opportunity to have money. We have the opportunity to have uh, our dream, an American dream. But unfortunately, some people don't even get a dream because they're hungry. They go to bed with hungry. And I feel this is important, what we're talking today, and not only about the United States, but international, around the world. And we should keep talking and more about this and fight about this. But I think the essence of this is love. If we will love each other, we will understand, we will be humble to share what I have, what I own, my company. I can maybe help to, to other people with my love to share food, right? And we are not gonna be that many. So I think being uh, more educated, more knowledgeable, the real education, it will also help us to understand that love is what is missing. We should love each other. Thank you. Any other questions or comments?
Hi, everybody. Um, when I came down here today, my expectations were we're going to march and we're going to see different things. We're going to all come together and, and, you know, for this one common cause. But as I begin to walk and I begin to think, how does this impact me? So I would like for all of you all to think, how does this impact me? It's not only, we're not only here for a march, we're here for an awakening. Because when you leave Dominican, we have to apply this to the community because everybody doesn't look like you. Everybody doesn't think like you. Everybody doesn't have what you have. Like the young lady said, we're not a race. It's not a race. It's not about race. We're not trying to outdo each other. It's about, like she said, love coming together and helping one another. Because it's only in love and acceptance are we as future dietitians going to be able to impact the next generation and also impact this generation. Um, I want to share a personal testimony. I have a sister that has scar sacidosis, which is little lung sacs on her, uh, sacs of pus on her lungs. And at one time she was gainfully employed and then she was diagnosed with this disease, debilitating disease. So within the last three weeks, she's now on oxygen 24 hours a day. She can now no longer afford to live by herself. She has a house she has to sell now because the government has stated she can only get $16 a month for food stamps. So what is $16 going to do? She worked. She contributed. She has to give up her house and live with me. So even though it may not impact you today, you don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know how food stamps, how cuts are going to impact you. So have compassion, have love, and remember, it's not a race. We should all get there together at the same time. Thank you. Any more comments? Where's Marina? Marina, you were supposed to give a talk. You were supposed to speak. Marina was supposed to give a talk on the march. I know I was, but okay. So was Hannah. Hannah, you're next. Um, hi, my name is Marina Calvo, and um, I don't know how to start this. I. Ooh, I'm very passionate about politics, as my classmates know, uh, especially to do the, to the good for others. Um, as I started my career in dietetics and as I, I've been getting educated and learning and reading and reading, the more sad I get, the more, um, the more anxious I, I get to get involved, to try to help, to, and to be more involved to areas where it really matters, you know, the policy, because that's where we, that's where everything happens. And um, I don't know, I just, uh, right now we're just uh, listening to the speakers who were up here talking about it, and one thing that struck my mind, and it was that, and maybe I'm generalizing, but that's what I noticed, that all our baby boomers are still making such an impact in our, in our world today. And even though with all the bad stuff that's still going on, they're still in the front lines. They're still with the, they're still with their efforts to make this world a better place. Even though all this greed, greediness, and with all these injustices, injustices are happening, they're still fighting until the last breath to keep going and to fight for a better world. And to me, it it, it gets me it gets me the awareness and it kind of scares me to know that the future is going to be depending upon us now that we are that we are young we are in our we're going we're going into our 30s and we have to have the we're going to have the energy and the power to keep continue the work because they can only hold so much for us like professor white just seeing her in the front line with and she's just saying you know food is a right and and she's on, she's you know she look at her she's small and and she's you know <laughs> tiny and and with the police, no police, she's still going forward, she's not scared, she's not embarrassed, and that's love. That's love for life, love for, for the rights, love for what we are. We are humans, and, and we have the right to breathe and to have, the, to have a, a roof upon, upon our head and to have food and, and to do all that, but it's gonna be depending upon us to fight for that and, and just to see those shoes that I have to fill and, 
and I'll try my best, Professor Wright. I will try, you know, and and I will someday. I hope I can I can make this, the same impact as you have. And um, and then uh, early this week, I also went to another event, which I throw myself out there because uh, it was a fundraiser. Um, I met a wonderful people, and they called me out for a fundraiser. And I thought of, uh, it was a Monday, not Tuesday, and. Um, Nobody, none of my friends were around to go with me. They were too busy. And I just, you know, I said, why not? I never, I never gone, I, I got dressed and I went. And I only knew one person. And then there was this uh, Father Bruce. Um, he's well known, but maybe not. And uh, they were having a fundraise to raise money actually for little kids in the back of the yards to give them food. And it was like for a dollar and 50 cents, they can feed two kids. So that was like the, the, the whole fundraiser. And I didn't even know what the fundraiser was about, but I just show up and it was all connected to what I'm, what I'm going for. And when he speaks, he says something. He's like, when we often thinking about helping somebody, we often thinking what's gonna happen to me when I help them. You know, maybe I'm a stranger. You know, we're like, oh my God, if I help this guy or this person, they're gonna be hooked on me and they're gonna be looking for me and oh my God, I don't wanna help because maybe they're gonna take advantage of me or they're lying to me, right? But then he thought, he, he thought about uh, a good lesson. He said, think about it this way. What's going to happen to them if you don't help them? And that is so true. And that's actually the way I live my life. Because at this moment, I have my uncle who is very sick. And uh, I'm going through my internship. And at one minute, I thought I was never going to make it. And I'm still going through it. And I cannot let go of him. He, we have family. I mean, we, we have family who can help and stuff. But I took on to take care of him because I cannot think of him, what would happen to him if I'm not there for him. You know, through all this system of disability, doctors, letters, this and this, and all these things, I have to be in the front lines to help him. And he holds on to me. And it is a big responsibility towards me because he doesn't have any kids. He doesn't have anybody. You know, he has our aunts and uncles, I mean, and stuff. But he never lived and never had a life. And to me, he says, you're like my daughter. Don't leave me, Marina. Don't leave me. Because sometimes he really drives me crazy. <laughs> but the responsibility that he's holding on, like, please don't, don't leave me hanging. And it's like so much effort. So and that's the way I think of him that sometimes I'm like, forget it. You know, somebody else take on the responsibility. But I know that there is a, there's a responsibility that I have to look out for him because what's gonna happen to him if I let go of the ball? And the same thing, it goes with everything else that we do in life. I'm sure you're gonna run into your life somebody who's gonna need the help and just, you know, give your hand. That's it. Hey, anybody else? All right. If not, um, we'll bring it to a close.